Good day, and welcome to Group 3's presentation on bleached corals versus corals with the stony coral tissue loss disease. Group 3 consists of Angelina Thomas, Viandre Rochester, Evans Valsius, and Mia Joseph. Before we begin, here is some important background information. I'm the Education and Research Coordinator for Coral World Ocean Park, and today we've been talking about bleaching and the stony coral tissue loss disease. So, corals are animals just like people, but they have this really incredible mutualistic symbiotic relationship with this single-celled algae called zooxanthellae. That zooxanthellae gives the coral pretty much all of its food, up to 90 plus percent of its food from that from its zooxanthellae. Um, which is great. However, during the summertime, the water temperature increases a little too much for a little too, for a long period of time, and that coral has to kick out its zooxanthellae. So that is what we call bleaching, okay? And the reason why it's called bleaching is because the zooxanthellae actually gives the coral its color. So without its zooxanthellae, it has transparent tissue, which looks white, hence the name bleaching. However, just because the coral is bleached does not mean it is dead. It is still alive, um, especially if you are snorkeling or diving on a reef and you get to look at the coral, the polyp structure, you can see that the animal is still there, that the living tissue is still there. Um, and the coral can regain its zooxanthellae and it can recover from bleaching. However, if it isn't able to do that, um, after about a month or two, the coral's chances of recovering are very slim and there's a very good chance it's gonna succumb to at least partial mortality. Um, but if the coral does recover, that's really great news for the coral. However, it has been starving for quite a period of time and so it is highly susceptible to opportunistic infectious, infectious diseases and other infectious diseases, um, such as white plague. So, bleaching isn't great for the coral because it makes them susceptible to those infectious diseases. Now, the stony coral tissue loss disease, this is, this is a very interesting dynamic disease. Um, it's, it's a lethal rapid tissue loss disease, so that means that it actually doesn't, it's losing its tissue, it's actually dying. Um, so, stony coral tissue loss disease, uh, it spreads rapidly from reef to reef, from coral to coral. Um, we know that it does spread through the water column, and so a coral that is down current from another coral could get infected with SETLD based off of those currents. Um, Sony coral tissue loss disease, like I said, is highly lethal, so it has a 60 to 100% uh, prevalence rate in communities, which is extremely high. Um, not only that, but um, it is known to cause mortality in a very short period of time, so in days to weeks to months, the coral colony that is infected with stony coral tissue loss disease can completely succumb to that infection. And once that coral is gone, there is no chance for it to regrow itself back. Um, it is completely dead. So, uh, based off of this disease, oh, it also affects about half of our stony corals here in the Virgin Islands. So it affects a lot of our really important reef building species and also some endangered species as, as well. So it's a devastating tissue loss disease. It doesn't have a season, which is different from other coral diseases. So it pretty much runs all year long, um, which is very unfortunate as well. So not all corals are highly susceptible to the stony coral tissue loss disease, and it does vary by different species. Um, our most susceptible corals are our brain corals and our pillar corals, our maize corals and our flower corals. Um, and then some more really important reef building corals, such as star corals and starlet corals, usually get infected about a month after those species are infected and succumb to that disease. Now, what are we doing to um, stop this disease or at least, you know, mitigate and manage its impacts? Well, a group of nonprofit organizations, government organizations, and the University of the Virgin Islands have gone together to create this group called the Coral Disease Advisory Committee. Um, we call it the Coral Disease Advisory Committee because we also have representatives from Puerto Rico who are helping us uh, manage this devastating coral disease. Um, so I'm a part of the VI Coral Disease Advisory Committee or the Coral Disease Advisory Committee. And what we do is we meet once a week and we discuss different methods and ways to track this disease, uh, figure out how it's affecting our coral reefs, and then different interventions that we can perform to prevent it from spreading um, and, and affecting so many corals. And so I'm actually a part of the core uh, strike team, St. Thomas strike team. Um, and out here is actually one of our monitoring stations. So what 
what we'll do is we'll go out on the reef and we will identify corals that have stony coral tissue loss disease. We will photograph them, tag them, and then treat them with this topical paste. It's kind of like a neosporin and it has a one to eight ratio of amoxicillin, which is an antibiotic, and then this substance called base to b which was created by Core RX and Ocean Alchemist up in Florida. And we use that to treat the corals oh my God. and track them. So, um, <laughs> a lot of work going on with this disease. Uh, if you guys want to learn more, please go to the VI Coral Disease Advice, vicoraldisease.org and check out all of the different work that has been going on down here in the Virgin Islands for the past two years. Good day. My name is Amos Paul. My name is Grandjo Chester. My name is Mia Joseph. And we are group three. The name of this experiment is Comparing Environmental Factors and Virgin Island Corals. Our group's hypothesis is that teaching will have a greater impact on the corals and the coral tissue losses. My name is Mia Joseph. Our group's hypothesis is that bleaching will have more of an effect on the corals than the stony coral tissue loss disease. This experiment was an oxygen tank, weights, mass of snorkel, the diameter of this is an octopus, fins, and my So we were able to dive off the platform of the coral world and we took, took data on some of the different corals using a wet pad. What we observed were healthy corals, corals affected by the stony. Coral tissue loss disease and corals that were bleached or peeled. Hello everyone, my name is Angelina and these are our data and results. The data collected from our scuba divers gives insight on the health of our local coral species. Collected on May 7th at the Seaport Beach at a constant temperature of 81 degrees, the product data can be compared. Based on the data, it can be implied that the corals are mostly in good standing. However, the OFAV, the MCAV, and the SSID species are affected by a few cases of skittles, compared to OFRA species case of bleaching and pale complexion, and the SSID's black spot disease. Evidence shows that bleaching is not as prevalent than skittles here in our ocean environment. The histogram was constructed to display the set of data in addition to a 5% error range and error amount for each value. To conclude this video, my group's hypothesis was proven to be incorrect. Bleaching did not affect more corals than the SCTLD. This experiment was very informative as it brought me and my peers closer to the coral life, their importance, and the reasons why we should preserve their very existence. We greatly commend the experts at Coral World for making this lab such an amazing experience. Today, my name is Vianjo Rochester and today I will be telling you about the benefits of creating lab videos. The benefits of creating lab videos are it allows the audience to learn in a fun and entertaining environment. The audience is able to read along to what the presenter is saying and look at visual representations that engages their mind. Video labs are beneficial because they provide on-field review concepts in a risk-free zone. The offer of blended learning allows learners to become engaged with the lab, boosting confidence and supplying transferable laboratory and technological skills. Video labs allow me to express my creativity and knowledge within a manageable time frame. One benefit of creating lab videos is that if you're like me and you learn better with visual representations, then a video of a lab can be more helpful to your understanding. One benefit that I have found from the video labs are that they give me a better understanding of the material. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you in the next one.